Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, our presentation will cover the following topics. I will start with a, a very brief background of the two papers that we prepared last year that are the basis of this afternoon's discussion. Uh, then Queen will provide an overview of the internet value chain, zoom in on the connectivity segment, and then present key indicators of the Philippine ICT performance. I will then talk about the relevant policies and regulations in the sector and share with you some of the key issues that we have identified and then conclude with our recommendations. Next slide, please. Next. Okay, so um, in a dynamic uh, sector such as ICT, there is a need to update the regulatory framework for telecommunications, which underpins the digital economy. So the first study builds on a 2017 regulatory, uh, regulatory review that we did, while the second study provides a first look at the digital value chain in the Philippines and the competition issues in the sector. We focused on a specific component uh, of the value chain, which is internet connectivity. In both papers, we relied on a um, review of the literature, industry and trade statistics, uh, statistics from the PSA, international organizations, company websites, and market studies, if available. We also used uh, administrative data from relevant government agencies. We interviewed both government and industry to validate our initial findings and to gain more insights. In both studies, we have identified areas for improvement. So for this afternoon, we will present the issues and recommendations through the lens of structural reform. Next slide, please. So what is structural reform? Uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, it consists of improvements made to institutional frameworks, regulations, and government policy, which helps foster an economic environment that supports the efficient functioning of markets and ultimately enhances living standards. And so uh, there's a view that actually structural reform is a uh, competition policy in its broadest possible sense. Now, uh, structural reform should be seen as a package. So there's an agenda that consists of um, liberalization. So this involves removing barriers to entry, both for domestic participants and foreign players. Uh, it also involves regulation. Uh, so regulation must ensure that uh, economic uh, will guide economic outcomes when there are market failures. And then equally important are the institutions that uh, ensure that um, they, uh, we review the unnecessary burden or regulatory burden and also design and implement programs that will achieve their outcomes. And then equally important is governance. So developing transparency of institutional processes, including public sector management to serve the public good. Now, uh, next slide, please. So what sort of barriers are we looking at? So there are different ways to classify barriers, but we have here three that are relevant to our discussion this afternoon. One, you have natural barriers. These are the result of uh, the resource materials or inputs or technology that need to be uh, that are needed to be able to supply uh, a particular market. Then you have strategic barriers. Are these uh, come from or uh, emanate from the conduct of incumbent firms? And um, so, for example, uh, you have here bundling and tying and other uh, sorts of uh, practices. So I should note, however, that not all uh, of these practices are necessarily bad. So, for example, if it results in cheaper products or um, a steady supply of, of inputs, then uh, those are reasons for maintaining some of these strategic, strategic barriers. And then equally important are the policy and regulatory barriers, or equally serious rather. Uh, these are regulations that limit the number of participants or have restrictive uh, uh, requirements, for example. So uh, just like the strategic barriers, Regulatory barriers could also be based on uh, legitimate reasons. 
for example, health or safety concerns, or even national security. Now, some policies that are uh, could be considered leg uh, legacy laws and regulations. So um, in these cases, for example, the natural barriers no longer exist because there is a change in technology, but somehow the regulation has not kept up with these changes. Next slide, please. So in recent three years, we have seen several reforms. Uh, most significant would be the Public Service Act Amendment, which liberalizes uh, foreign participation in various uh, services, including telecommunications. We have the Mobile Number Portability Act. Uh, this encourages competition by reducing the switching costs um, of mobile subscribers. We, the access to satellite services was also liberalized. And then you have uh, the policy on the common tower. Uh, so the intention here is to fast track the deployment of towers across the regions. And then ARTA is uh, essentially about reducing uh, regulatory burden. Now, the potential gains from these reforms uh, could be negated uh, by the lack of sound regulations and institutions, which are especially important for ensuring good quality infrastructure services. So our plan for this afternoon is to have a um, thoughtful discussion, a meaningful, meaningful conversation on the structural reforms that we need to pursue. But before, before that, we need to understand the overall landscape. And so I will now hand over the presentation to Queen. Thank you, Mamonet. So let's proceed with the internet value chain. Next slide, please. To understand the digital sector, A.T. Kearney for GSMA developed the internet value chain. It is composed of five segments, namely content rights, online services, enabling technology and services, internet access, connectivity, and user interface. Globally, majority of or 57% of the revenues came, for, came from online services segment, followed by internet access connectivity, which is 15%, user interface, enabling technology, and content rights with 3% in 2020. But given the complexity of the digital value chain with numerous layers and players, the term value web is deemed more suitable to reflect the convergence of previously separate value chains or segments. Next slide, please. So these are the forms of convergence. Convergence refers to the erosion of boundaries among previously separate networks services and business practices which have implications for government policy and regulation. According to Singh and Raja, this include network convergence, where a common standard allows several types of networks to connect with each other, enable, which enables location and network independent service provision. Service convergence or multi-play, the second one, enables one network to provide multiple services that traditionally required separate networks. This type of convergence changes the scope and boundaries of markets and alter entry barriers. The third one is technological convergence, where a single device performs many types of functions and delivers many formats of content. And lastly, the corporate convergence, in which Firms in one sector acquire, merge, or collaborate with firms in other sectors. This convergence creates a new business model and alter market structure, changing the dynamics of the sector. Next slide, please. So the following are the examples of the participants in the internet value chain in the Philippines. From the content rights and online services, such as video streaming apps, content, content influencers, e-commerce websites, digital games and social media to enabling technologies such as online marketing and advertising and payment platforms to internet access connectivity and user interface next slide please the philippines digital market revenue for example reached uh, 1.9 billion dollars in 2021 the majority came from the digital games followed by electronically published content and digital video contents and music. 
um, regarding the online services, which consists of e-commerce, transport and food, online travel and online media, 70% uh, of the revenue came from e-commerce segment, followed by online media with $2.8 billion and so on. In terms of enabling technologies and services, 97% of digital merchants are accepting digital payments and 67% of them use digital lending solutions. Um, about 43 million made digital payments in 2021 with total annual value of $16 billion and annual, spend, annual spending in 2021 reached $1 billion with 21% increase compared to 2020. And the ma majority of these advertisements are from banner ads. Next slide, please. So in terms of the fifth uh, segment in the internet value chain, the user interface, this figure shows the most popular mobile vendor, mobile and desktop operating systems in the Philippines where Windows and Android dominate in their respective markets. Next slide, please. Next. So we will dive into the fourth segment of the internet value chain, which is the internet connectivity segment. This is the most critical element of the internet value chain. Uh, previous slide, please. So this is the, the, the internet connectivity segment is the most uh, critical element of the internet value chain. The participants in the internet value chain ultimately depend on broadband networks to reach final users or consumers. Communications via internet connects various foreign networks through international link and domestic networks via domestic backbone. While the middle mile connects backhole networks to nearest aggregation points and point of presence. And lastly, the last mile, which connects networks to end users. Next slide, please. So the country is connected to 10 international submarine cable systems and seven are and seven under construction, so 17 in total. There are eight cable landing points as shown in the figure, and one is in construction in Pagudpod. PLDT is one of the owners of the seven out of 17 uh total international submarine cable systems while global globe telecom owns three of them veto owns alc and converge ict owns ch2x next slide please in terms of domestic backbone the philippines domestic backbone infrastructure includes tldt's domestic fiber optic network Globe Telecom's two fiber optic backbone networks, Converge ICT's domestic submarine cable network, and, and NGCP or Transco backbone network, connecting various regions in the country. Next. So this table describes the different ways by which data travel between the internet service providers of the user and the content provider and vice versa, which is the middle mile. The market transaction that takes place in this segment is invisible to users. So this include internet exchange points, data centers and cloud services, and independent tower companies. So the internet service providers can choose to exchange data traffic via internet exchange point which can be offered and maintained by an external organization. Most of the IXPs or in the international exchange points in the Philippines are located in Luzon. Um, data centers and cloud services are growing in the Philippines as well. Many of the data centers are found in Luzon, but there are also some found in Cebu and Davao. So these data centers are usually telco grade and carrier neutral. And they also serve, uh, serve other services like cloud services, connectivity services, and security systems. Apart from the initiative of the incumbent players to construct communication infrastructure, independent tower companies are also available to expand coverage of um, internet 
especially in other areas of the country other than um, metro areas. Common towers can also host multiple mobile operators. There are currently 19 registered common towers uh, in the Philippines. Typically, they are constructed from incumbent tel telco operators through sale and list tax agreements. And nine of these uh, tower independent tower companies have foreign head offices. Next slide, slide please. So the final um, part of the internet connectivity value chain is the last mile, uh, whereas this uh, part is visible to the consumers who typically pay ISPs a monthly and on a monthly basis. Uh, These broadband connections include DSL service, cable modem service, fiber, wireless broadband, satellite, and broadband over power line. Based on NTC, NCR has the most number of ISPs with valid certificates issued by them, followed by Region 4A and Region 3. Note that regional addresses may not necessarily reflect areas of coverage. And there is no ISP with value certificate located in region B, A, R, and M. Next slide. So the figure shows the major internet service providers in the Philippines and the corresponding IT services revenues from 2019 to 2021. So PLDT service revenue reached uh, 216 billion pesos in 2021. Mobile with mobile service having the highest contribution, um, followed by home broadband and corporate data and ICT. Globe's majority of service revenue in 2021 um, came from mobile services as well, followed by home broadband and corporate data, which is the same as PLDP. While Converge offers business segments in enterprise and res residential, accumulating 26 billion pesos, while Dito Community Service uh, revenue is 2 billion pesos in 2021. Next. So through gaming franchise licenses, mergers, and acquisitions of businesses, PLBT and Globe was able to expand their business from providing fixed and mobile services respectively, enabling them to participate across the various components of the internet value chain as shown in the figures. They also have presence across the all the components of the internet connectivity segment from international link, domestic backbone, down to the, the last mile. Next. So in terms of market share from 2016 to 2020, Smart and Globe have dominated the market in terms of postpaid and prepaid mobile services. Globe has the highest broadband fixed wireless users, while PLDT or Smart has the highest fixed line users. Next slide, please. So this table shows the market concentration of mobile services for selected ASEAN countries, which was computed using the Herfindahl Kirchman Index or the HHI. Mobile services market are highly concentrated in the Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, and Singapore, while it is moderately concentrated in Malaysia. The computed HHI, however, is not comparable across the country since we base um, it was they are based on mobile subscriptions or revenue at different years, depending on data availability. Next slide. Other than telco operators, cable TV or CATV operators also provide broadband services. CATV or cable TV operators primarily provides broadband services in US and are major competitors of incumbent telecom operators in EU countries. According to the Executive Order 436 series of 1997, they recognize uh, it recognizes the role of 
cable TV systems as the national information highway to the countryside. So one of the associations of cable operators, the Philippine Cable and Telecommunication Association, INC, is an association of cable TV operators with members all over the country from first class cities and municipalities in NCR down to some six class cities and municipalities in region B A R M M in Mindanao. So they reach um, even area in Mindanao, which is the B A R M M. So as of September 2022, there are about 281 PCTA members nationwide serving about 84 cities and 192 municipalities. Next slide. Additionally, we have very small aperture terminal, VSAT or satellite systems, which are useful particularly for areas with poor telecommunications infrastructure. The table lists some of the examples of the satellite ISPs covering the Philippines. Next slide, please. So for the summary, the size of the digital sector is significant and comprises various activities, processes, and industries. The digital economy in the Philippines also accounts for 9.6 of the GDP in 2021. Um, the internet connectivity segment, which is the part of the the bigger internet value chain is the most critical element of the internet value chain. The participants of the internet value chain ultimately depend on broadband networks provided by this segment to reach final users or consumers. In the internet uh, connectivity segment, uh, it is dominated by vertically integrated telecommunications companies, PLDT and Globe. The dominant firms in this segment have also expanded their footprint to other segments in the international in the internet value chain. And however, other than telco operators, cable TV operators, and satellite or VSAT providers also provide broadband services. Next slide. So we look now into the Philippine ICT performance. For the ICT prices among the ASEAN countries, Philippines has third is the third most expensive ICT services across this price baskets in 2021, with the fixed broadband being the most expensive and mobile broadband being the most affordable. Next slide, please. In terms of availability, about um, 50% less than 50% of individuals have internet, internet access and only 17.7% of households in the Philippines have internet access with regions 9, 10, and BARMM with the least proportion of household with internet. Next slide, please. Regarding the speed performance, fixed download speed in the Philippines performs average compared with the ASEAN countries while mobile download speed ranks 7 out of 10 ASEAN countries as of this month. I will now give the time to Mamanet to continue. Okay, thank you, Queen. So we now look at the regulatory environment. Uh, next slide, please. So a useful framework for identifying areas for improvement or reform in uh, telecommunications is the one developed by the International Telecommunications Union. It involves four clusters that are aligned uh, to the elements of structural reform that I presented earlier. A, a comprehensive study by the ITU in 2021 uh, found that the regulatory institutional framework which is composed of um, the regulatory authority, regulatory mandate, regulatory regime, and competition model is linked to a positive and significant increase in telecommunications investment. So the four pillars are um, complementary. And I should add that in 2017, my colleague uh, Tina Ortiz also did a study and found that 
an effective uh, regulatory authority with the proper mandate is necessary to enforce the regulatory regime or specific rules and the competition framework. So next slide. Okay, so these are the relevant laws and regulations that govern telecommunications um, and industry participants. So the main uh, law would be the Public Telecommunications Policy Act of 1995. So all the regulations uh, by the NTC would be based on this particular um, law and also um, other laws such as the radio control law as amended. Now, in the following slides, I will highlight the issues and challenges that have been identified, which could be due to the regulations or the, uh, lack thereof. Next slide, please. So the independent regulator is the gold standard in regulation, especially for infrastructure services such as telecommunications, where credibility and stability are of paramount importance. When adopted both in law and in practice, uh, in practice the independent regulator of uh, governance leads uh, to better sector outcomes. Now, regulators need to be sufficiently insulated from short-term political pressure and regulatory capture by industry. So there are many attributes of regulatory independence, but so these are just some examples of the lack of independence of the NTC. So it was created um, by an executive order and it is headed by a commissioner and two deputies. In 1997, the Supreme Court ruled that the NTC is a collegial body and that uh, decision-making is not vested on the commissioner alone, but still the designations uh, remain. The EO also provides some guidance on the professional qualifications or technical backgrounds of commissioners. Now, uh, the commissioners and directors uh, should be uh, appointed to fixed terms following good practice and global best practice and that their terms of office should not coincide with the terms of government and, uh, and sorry, legislature. But um, so the NTC, uh, NTC officials do not have fixed terms of office. They are also not shielded from litigation in the exercise of their functions. Uh, the regulatory agency must have the power to establish administrative structure and also make all relevant personnel decisions. But in the case of NTC, uh, of course, they need the approval of the DBM. Regulatory agencies must also have a stable and reliable source of revenue for their operations. Moreover, it should be able to offer a competitive compensation package and career opportunities, including training and education. Now, uh, in terms of um, financial and rather sources of funding, so the ideal setup is where multiple sources of funding are provided. So this would allow the financial independence and uh, greater autonomy in decision making. In the case of the NTC, the sole funding source is government appropriation. Uh, given this, so it may impact their independence, efficiency, and the cost of regulation, and also impact the autonomy and competence with respect to carrying out its responsibilities. So fees collected are by the NTC are remitted to the National Treasury in line with the one fund concept. And the next slide, please. The annual budget of the NTC is typically less than 10% of the amount uh, it collects. So this slide shows you the, just compares the different fees or revenues collected by the um, NTC and it, the uh, budget that it receives. So the biggest proportion of revenue comes from spectrum user fees, and then they also collect other forms of um, fees such as supervision and regulation, fees, um, revenues from re registration, licensing and inspection, and other uh, sources. So in 2020, the NTC collect, 
NTC collected a total revenue of 7.7 .7 billion um, pesos. But as I mentioned, the actual budget that the NTC receives is typically less than um, 10%. So in 2020, that would be about 8% uh, if you exclude the budget that they received for a locally funded project. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, in terms of mandate, having a converged, uh, converged regulator with authority over ICT and media broadcast uh, and broadcasting is in line with international best practices. This setup allows more efficient in, uh, more efficiency in planning and uh, in introducing converged technologies and services to the market. Uh, the NTC could be considered a converged regulator as it has responsibility for telecommunications, uh, media broadcasting, as well as spectrum. So there was no issue raised with respect to the NTC's mandate, only to stress that uh, they need the resources and capacities to be effective. It should also be noted that the NTC has a role to play in promoting competition. So this reinforces the need for regulatory independence. Next slide, please. So the management of radio spectrum is another issue that was, ra uh, that was raised in our interviews. It is considered a finite resource, although technolo um, technological advancements are now improving the efficiency of radio spectrum utilization. It is also a national resource that should serve or fulfill uh, various national goals and functions. So it's not only for commercial applications. It is the job of the NTC to grant permits for the use of radio frequencies. And um, it has to allocate, sub-allocate these frequency bands uh, based on the ITU um, guidance. While spectrum is associated, uh, or rather is assigned through ad, uh, an administrative process, it is recalled through a quasi-judicial process. So um, if the state wants to recall assigned spectrum, the NTC will need to conduct hearings. Now to date, the, all frequencies have been awarded through a simple admin process described as beauty contest. Where demand for specific frequencies exceed availability, the commission uh, can hold open tenders. Uh, however, this has not yet been done. The uh, NTC tried to do this before, but was faced with um, legal challenge from the, one of the operators. Uh, next, in, uh, so in terms of transparency, uh, in 2017, there was a Senate committee report recommending uh, to increase competition via a more transparent system of, of spectrum allocation, assignment, and reforming, as well as the development, promotion, and deployment of a competitive selection process in the allocation of publicly owned spectrum. Uh, next, it was also noted that in other countries, priority in the use of of spectrum is given to the military, law enforcement, and emergency services, but there is no such policy in the Philippines. The policy on spectrum should also consider support for research and development in the ICT sector, especially those conducted by the government. The DOSD, uh, ASD, which conducts uh, R&D in ICT and electronics, However, they, uh, so they told us that they are bound by the same policies and regulations imposed on private entities. Um, for example, so in terms of off-spectrum assignments, permits, and licenses. Uh, next, there is no use or the use of radio frequency spectrum uh, obviously will have multiple stakeholders, but um, there's a need for a coherent framework where everybody is subject to the same rules and no sector is favored. And then finally, there is a need to have a plan or a roadmap so that stakeholders will know what band will be opened up in the future or a timeline for awarding spectrum so they can invest or plan their investments properly. 
Uh, so in Singapore, for example, when they assign spectrum to players, they always reserve some for future expansion. Next slide, please. So since public services are vested with public interest, enterprises engaged in these industries are regulated and required to secure some form of certification or authority. Following international best practice, only one entity, typically the regulator, should have sole authority for licensing. An unbiased and independent authority is in the best position to determine authorization. Now, uh, in the Philippines, we have its um, two entities, Congress and the NTC. Although Congress can delegate uh, this to an administrative agency, such as the NTC, um, based on RA 7925, uh, a legislative franchise and CPCN uh, are required. So the requirement to obtain a franchise applies to six types of entities. And but if you are a value added, sorry, I will need more more time than um just more than five minutes. Uh, however, for value-added providers, a franchise is not required if you do not uh, set up your own network. And then there's also an issue with respect to the licenses and permits. And what else? Ah, okay, the quasi-judicial nature and versus administrative processes, which could slow down any um, decision-making or changes uh, that the NTC might want to introduce. Next slide, please. So internet service is considered a value added service. So, and uh, a telecom company uh, can provide value added services subject to certain conditions to prevent possible anti-competitive behavior. So the uh, regulations are listed here on the screen, but I would like to, I guess, um, highlight one particular uh, phrase, which is to the public. I think this regulation should be examined further because it seems to me that this is not uh, the correct interpretation of non-discrimination as it applies to a vertically integrated firm. Uh, the next, in the next slide, there is another circular, another circular which seems to have a more appropriate or accurate uh, interpretation. So again, if you are a non, um, TV slide, please. If you are not a telco entity, then you are not uh, required to um, uh, get a franchise. However, you must use the facilities of uh, and franchise telcos. And then in terms of final prices, the rates for VAS services are deregulated. Next slide, please. So access charges and revenue sharing arrangements are negotiated and NTC only intervenes when parties fail to reach an agreement. And under compulsory arbitration and interconnection, uh, there are 10 factors that are considered, including the promotion of competition. All authorized telcos are required to submit uh, request access offers, or rather reference access offers, which contains the conditions. Um, conditions to provide access to other providers. Next slide, please. Now, to avoid uh, anti-competitive conduct of a vertically integrated firm, uh, one option is uh, to impose structural separation. This was the model used in the U.S., and we've also done it in the electricity power industry. Uh, however, in, uh, for the Philippine Telecom, accounting separation was the modality selected. So if, uh, again, so uh, in line with this, the NTC developed a uniform system of, of accounts, which all telcos must use in their reports uh, submitted to the commission. Next slide, please. Um, so what I just presented are considered ex ante regulation. So by definition, these uh, regulations seek to prevent or prevent harmful conduct from occurring. Competition law applies um, ex post, 
but the distinction is actually not uh, as straightforward. So under the competition law, um, the prohibited acts are anti-competitive agreements, abuse of dominant position, and uh, anti-competitive mergers and acquisitions. There's also um, uh, some criteria to follow uh, in the case of mandatory notifications. This is based on the size of the party and the size of transactions, both, both of which are based on the assets or revenues. Um, next is the concept of the significant uh, market power. So uh, this is used as a guide to actually determine access regulations or the ex-ante regulations that I mentioned before. Um, so in the Philippine context, uh, market share is not the only basis for determining SMP. The other interesting development is the mainstreaming of competition policy. Uh, and this is, uh, so this compels all agencies to work together. And so this is um, useful, uh, useful development because it compels the NTC and other agencies to collaborate with the uh, competition commission. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are the barriers identified in various reports and, and uh, these were also experienced on the ground based on our interviews. The first is, can, uh, which, uh, which is related to the high cost of bandwidth, uh, this can be attributed to both legal and, and strategic barriers. So internet service providers can only purchase bandwidth from enfranchised public uh, entities. Um, international bandwidth providers are not allowed to sell to local clients without going through a commercial agreement with a local telco. Uh, and um, these telcos are able to buy capacity from the source at a lower price and adjust their selling prices to their competitors. So in fact, so one of the uh, panelists this afternoon, Ms. Melandilia Santos, um, observed that small players suffer high wholesale, pr uh, wholesale prices from big telcos owning to the landing stations um, and backbone networks. And so similar uh, um, observations were cited in other publications as well. The other, uh, the second barrier is a policy barrier. This is with respect to the requirement of a congressional uh, franchise. So, uh, independent internet providers are limited in their ability to develop their infrastructure, get, ac uh, get access to spectrum, and deploy various internet uh, technologies because of the necessity to acquire a, a franchise. The third, with respect to expensive poll rental and bureaucratic requirements, is a combination of both natural and regulatory barriers. So uh, natural, for example, because if you want to set up um, uh, internet, uh, uh, I think the minimum, for example, or provide internet service, the minimum is um, smallest fiber optic device is say a, a thousand subscribers, but then you have to deal with other uh, utility providers as well to, uh, to be able to optimize and use their infrastructure. And then other network expansion, uh, activities are complicated by um, complicated by permitting uh, permits and regulations by other units. The last is in terms of co uh, technical competence. So, in the short run, the lack of manpower is a natural barrier um, to in any industry uh, that wants to expand its services. Next slide, please. So these are just examples of the complaints or cases that we have um, witnessed in the last few years. You have, we always hear about interconnection issues. The last one was in uh, last year between uh, DITO and Globe and Smart Communications. In terms of mergers, uh, mergers and acquisitions, we have um, one in 2013, uh, when PLDT filed a complaint uh, against Globe's acquisition of Bayan, uh, Bayantel. And then in 2016, when uh, there was, uh, when Globe and PLDT purchased uh, San Miguel's Telco assets. The th uh, third type of uh, complaint refers to exclusive dealings. 
this is with respect to say um condominiums that only authorize a particular internet provider to provide a service in their uh, in their building and then the another uh, type of complaint refers to spectrum assignment uh, so in the 2016 uh, there was a complaint about uh, one company uh, being assigned um, the, a lot of the or most of the uh, frequency bands okay <laughs> next slide so this is final section Next, please. Uh, so the obviously we really want to emphasize the need for an independent regulator. According to UNCTAD, the establishment of an independent regulator is one of the key determinants of private investment in digital development. Together with privatization and competition, they provide investors with confidence in the quality of the regulatory environment of a country. The existence of an independent regulatory agency in particular signals impartiality in decision making and regulatory certainty, regardless of changes in government. The other one with uh, recommendation is uh, with respect to the need to develop a policy framework for radio spectrum. Uh, this should be developed say, by DITC together with DOST and DTI and other agencies to ensure that the um, they take into account the changes in technology, the industry roadmaps, the technology roadmaps, uh, and they, they're able to forecast demand and encourage long-term investment. The third is with respect to the licensing regime. The, so uh, basic, the most uh, critical at this, uh, in this particular aspect would be the need for a, a legislative franchise this is not aligned with international best practice. And actually the National Broadband Plan has also identified many other um, reforms in order to uh, upgrade or uh, make sure that the licensing regime is now more attuned or aligned with the technology uh, and the services and techno technologies that have been developed. So the fourth bullet here is really just to um, to reiterate that uh, the digital value chain of the Philippines is dominated by two vertically integrated companies because structural separation is not um, imposed in the Philippines. And although we recognize that this could create efficiencies, um, obviously they could also leverage this to limit competition. And therefore, um, unfortunately, the lack of uh, competition in up upstream markets uh, are now, um, I think, largely due to legal or artificial barriers and not to uh, natural barriers anymore. So this is a key impediment um, in internet connectivity. And then last slide. So next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of access regulations, as I mentioned, uh, there the, it exists. There are several regulations that are supposed to um, prevent anti-competitive behavior. And I think at this point, I, I hope the PCC can scrutinize or should scrutinize all the existing access regulations to determine if these need to be strengthened. And a third party auditor could also be brought in to determine if these were enforced. Um, another recommendation is, is with respect to um, an open access framework and increased transparency. Um, I, I think uh, Ms. Grace will talk about this, so I won't elaborate anymore. And then in terms of uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, as I mentioned, right now it only covers um, assets and the revenues, but in the case of uh, uh, the digital sector, perhaps uh, it, they should also look at um, uh, radio spectrum and also the amount of data that is collected and generated by the different entities as a basis for determining the size of um, a particular uh, company. Uh, no collaboration is needed so that, uh, so there must be ongoing efforts to reduce uh, regulatory burden. 
And then there's also a need to invest in the broadband workforce to ensure that um, uh, this will not be a hindrance to the deployment of access of broadband in the country. And then the final point is that um, as a country, uh, as uh, Queen mentioned, we're still very much behind in terms of the addressing the digital divide. So this should uh, still be the policy priority. Thank you.